You know, I, I joke about this, but um, one of the things that um, non-pastors, non-preachers are not aware of is that uh, every now and then, hopefully often, you remember the, the responsibility you have to help people uh, live their lives well as Christians so that they can end up in heaven and stand before God with um, knowing and having God say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know? Um, um, I realize that my words and all the training I've had for years and years, decades really, uh, can't change your mind unless you decide to have your mind changed about some things. Unless you decide to align your thoughts with the thoughts of the Bible, with the thoughts of God. And I realize too that uh, that process is really only possible with the Holy Spirit. So I'd like you to pray with me just for a moment that the Holy Spirit would have his way with you today. Jesus said he would, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he would send another, he said, I won't leave you as orphans. I'm going to heaven, I'm leaving earth, I'm going to heaven, but I'm not going to leave you orphans, but I'm going to send you another comforter, an invisible comforter this time. And instead of me living in this body, Jesus, being incarnate in one body, that Holy Spirit is going to be incarnate in all of your bodies. God's going to incarnate himself, basically. He's going to become um, a resident of your a body. as your, You're his temple. So let's pray to that Holy Spirit. Lord, Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus said you would lead us into all truth and you would remind us of the things of Jesus and even tell us things about the future. You are our comforter. You are our, our coach. You're, our, you're leading us. We want to be led. Romans says those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit today. So please open our hearts to receive the words of life, the words of truth, the words of God, so that our hearts may be uh, fully alive in Jesus. Our lives may be fully um, demonstrations of the life of Jesus. And so that when we stand before you one day, Lord, we can come with great joy and know that we have done our best to, to represent you, to follow you, to obey you as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for these uh, few precious moments now, and we thank you for your, your help uh, for the preacher. Amen. <laughs> All right. So last uh, week, uh, my, Pastor Michael Simone was here. Um, a very uh, wonderful uh, servant of the Lord, and he said a couple of things that I just want to remind you of. He said he had, there had been a study of a lot of older people, seniors, and they asked them what things in their life they had, um, what lessons they had gleaned from living a long time, and uh, things maybe they would do differently. And two of the things he said was that the older people, the consensus was they would reflect more when they were living their life. They wish they had reflected more and kind of been more thoughtful about how they were living their life. And secondly, that they would have taken more risk. R-I-S-K, risk. You know, there's a saying that, how do you spell faith? R-I-S-K. Um, you really can't uh, have faith if it, if it doesn't involve risk. If it's a sure thing, it's not faith. It's fact. So everything that we do as Christians, God wants it to be done in, by faith. So that means we do things that aren't, uh, totally uh, reasonable in some sense, you know. Uh, loving your enemies doesn't seem reasonable. <laughs> but God says, do that by faith. Love them, and, and I'll bless you, and I'll, I'll work in that situation. Th those kinds of things. So I'd like to help us reflect today on what kind of lives we're living as disciples of Jesus Christ. And it's kind of been, that motif has been sort of uh, in and out of several things we've sung and already said, but I want to sort of focus ourselves uh, on this particular theme um, and uh, from the scriptures provide some uh, clarity and some um, motivation for living our lives more intensely, more fervently as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And everything I'm going to say today is to your advantage. Um, if five years from now you haven't listened to these words, I, you may uh, re remember that with regret. I guarantee you that 500 years from now, if you 
don't listen to these words, you will, have re you will regret not listening. Because these are very, they're the words of the scriptures, the words of God. And it's not just this, this sermon, but, but, but almost every sermon you hear has something in there that will change your life for the better. And God wants you to have the best life possible here on earth and in heaven. We have a whole nether life in heaven. Really, the life we were made for is in heaven. We're here just for 80 years, plus or minus 20. Uh, it's so delightful to see these young children in church. I just love kids at that age. I have, we had four, and I'm so glad you brought them. Thank you. Just a, a delight. Um, 80 years plus or minus 20, but eternity is forever. So I encourage you all to reverse engineer your life, which means to look at what you're hoping to be in eternity. And there are things you do on earth that affect what kind of eternity you have. Not just getting into heaven, but what kind of heaven you have, right? So reverse engineer it and then say, okay, if I want to be that, then how do I live my life today? And every day here on earth. I know that's kind of a weird way of looking at uh, spirituality perhaps, but I think it's a valid way, you know? Some people say, well, what do you want to think about your life that's just before you die? Well, that's, that's another point to look at. But I'd say, look at you, what do you, where do you want to be in eternity? And, and wh what are the memories you want to have? And what are the joys you want to have? You know, that you did reflect and you did take risk and your life meant something that caused eternal impact for others as well as for yourself. So, the, the title of the message is called Move On Up Number Three. Move on up, number three. <laughs> Hang on to that. So it's from the parable of the sower and the four soils. Oh, yeah. So the soil number three. They were the folks who, the, 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 the sower went out to the seed, throw seeds on the ground. It represented the word of God. In this case, the gospel. And in the people uh, who received it in, in the soil number three, the soil represents the hearts of people who heard the word of God. So those people, it, it took root and it grew up, but then nothing came of it. There was no fruit. Maybe there were supposed to be tomatoes there or peppers. Yeah, I have a lot of peppers. In my Whatever, it didn't happen. Why? Because thorns and thistles covered that, that bush and it wasn't able to, and choked out the fruit of that, of that beautiful bush that was grown out of the word of God. It was a beautiful life, really, a uh, spiritual life out of the seed of God, but it was, the fruit of that was choked out by what? The cares and worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. So let's focus on the cares and worries of the world. We won't talk about the riches stuff. That's a whole other thing, but the love of money, you know, is a root of much evil. But many Christians today are being tested and tempted to focus on the cares and worries of the world. Well, I mean, it's self-evident, isn't it? Uh, my gosh, uh, COVID. Was George Floyd, the violent protest after George Floyd and the elections. For, for, a, for most people in America, those four things comprise a whole range of Roller coaster emotions, from the most of them down, and uh, and they have captured our imaginations. They've captured our time. They've captured our our emotions in ways that could choke out the life of God from the Word of God that's been planted in us. The cares and worries of the world. Romans twelve says, "Do not be conformed to the world." but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the good and perfect will of God is. If you watch a lot of network news and you dwell on what you hear on the network news, I guarantee you the world is going to conform you into its thinking. That 24-7 news thing is not a good deal. You know, whatever captures your, your, your thoughts hour after hour captures you. And so you have to be careful there. You have to put... You know, the Bible also says, I will put no evil thing before my... If you're constantly looking at angry uh, reports and, and accusations and, and bad things, uh, it's not going to be good for you spiritually, emotionally, or even physically. 
So this message is an exhortation to move up from number three to number four. The fourth soil people were the people who heard the word of God and it grew and produced the crop 30, 60, and 100 fold. So I want you to think about, reflect on, re-engineering your life so that you can be in that fourth soil. And for, for, for you that may mean different things than it does for other people, but I'm just helping you to reflect a little bit. Where, how am I living my life in this very strange 2020 year in America. Uh, I believe we're in a boot camp. I believe God is ta taking us through a valley of the shadow of death, kind of a, it's a test. Uh, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, we pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation. Well, that word, the Greek word, per perosmos, means test. It means to prove something. God doesn't, never tempts anybody to sin, but he, will, he does test Christians to see what's in their heart. He did it with Abraham your son Isaac. He did it with Job. He allowed Job to be tested by the devil. And when Jesus, right after he was baptized in the Jordan, in both Matthew and Luke, it says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tested of the devil. Perosmo, same word. Same word in James uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Count it all joy when you encounter various perosmos, various trials. For the parosmos of your faith, the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. So, you know, parents test their children. Are they going <laughs> they give them a job to do and see if they'll do it. Uh, you're uh, in a church. Before you can become an elder, you're supposed to be tested. You're in the Marine Corps. I, before you go to war, you're supposed to be tested in all kinds of ways. Why? Because they don't want you to die. They want to make sure you can handle, hand, handle that gun, handle that stress, be able to take orders and stuff like that. So any, whenever you do something important in life, as a doctor, they go through all kinds of residency tests, which are, it's a big, long test, to see if they know what they're doing before they put them out there as, as a doc. So testing is part of life. It's, it's part of the spiritual life. And, and, and it's done, uh, if it's done right, it's done by our people in authority over us so that we will be well-equipped to do the good works which God has prepared for us to walk in. You don't give a child a gun. You don't give a child uh, a scalpel. Uh, you wait till they grow up and they've, and they've been tested and trained before you release them to do that. Uh, folks, you're being tested. We're all being tested. There's a great revival coming upon the earth. Millions, perhaps billions of people will come into the kingdom. There aren't enough pastors. There aren't enough elders to take care of these people. You're going to have to take care of them. Your neighbors, your family, people in this city. When, when, when waves of people come into the kingdom, God's going to look for people who've been tested and trained and who've proven themselves faithful and say, You'll, your, your house could fill up. You, you all could have house churches, just like in the book of Acts. You all could be teachers. You all can be whatever God's called you to be, evangelists. And you're supposed to be. The pastors who, like Pastor Chris and I, uh, and evangelists, prophets, teachers, and apostles, our job is to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. And there's no comma there. To equip the saints to, to do the work of ministry. So our job is to equip you so you can do the ministry. You can pray with people and get them healed out there. There, I mean, Vanessa's not ordained. She didn't go to seminary, right? You didn't go to Bible school. But you prayed for this lady and she got healed. And uh, Josh, you've led somebody to the Lord. Uh, Kevin. So everybody can do this. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we'll be empowered to a much higher level and motivated, hopefully, to go out and, and care for these new Christians and bring them into the fold, share the gospel with them. That's why we have a gospel message every Sunday. We're trying to show you this is how it's done. This is how you can present the message that will change their eternal destiny. Folks, when I get to heaven, uh, I don't know about you, but the, the thing I will be most joyful about is that I got there and my family got there and other people that I helped made it to heaven. There's nothing that's going to top that, that the people I love and the people I've had contact with hopefully make it to heaven. There is nothing, no higher goal. They, they, could be, they could be poor, they could be millionaires, who cares, means nothing, but, but they make it to heaven. And so we want to live a life that, where God can release us and use us 
to be like Jesus, to bring eternal life and the forgiveness of sins to many others. God's purpose, you know, in all of this is to bless us. Every commandment he gives us is to bless us, not to limit us. Don't sin, because the sin will keep you from the blessing that he wants. So in the Lord's Prayer, very appropriately, when someone said, Jesus, teach us how to pray, he says, well, first, honor the Lord, our Father who art in heaven. Holy is your name. It's worship. Okay, holy is your name. All right, and he talks about giving us our daily bread, very practical. But then the very next thing is, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As Forgive us as we forgive. Forgiveness is a key thing in, in the God's mind when he's looking at a disciple of Jesus. So let's be honest. We've all been angry at something, um, maybe a, angry a lot in the past year. We've all seen things that were unjust, that were cruel, that were mean, that were fraudulent, that were, that should, that were not right. And, and we're all experiencing uh, a, uh, restrictions on our life that we don't like, and things like that. So we're, but we have to forgive. We have to forgive the politicians. We have to forgive people who've done things that have offended us um, in every sphere of life. We have to forgive pastors. We have to forgive members of our family. We have to forgive ourselves, even. Because if God forgives us, we need to forgive ourselves. There is an accounting in heaven. The parable of the talent says that. Whatever God gives you, he expects you to do something with it. Each one of us here has been given gifts, talents, abilities, skills, time, energy. You're on earth for a purpose. That's what, uh, that's what it says. That God has created you. You are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Uh, which he has prepared beforehand. So, just us turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse, verses 1 to 7. And um, it's Jesus speaking to, an, uh, to the seven churches in, in the uh, um, Asia Minor, thank you, which is, now, which is now Turkey and is mostly Muslim. But it was, all, it was mostly Christian until uh, the Muslims came along. Um, he says to the church in Ephesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, this is chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 1, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot endure evil men. It's good for you. And you put to test those who call themselves apostles. See, they even tested apostles back then to make sure that they were the real apostles. And they are not. And you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and you've endured for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. And so those are all um, commendations from Jesus to the church of Ephesus, which was a regional church. It covered the whole city of Ephesus. Paul was there for three years, hundreds of house churches, some Jewish, some Gentile. This is a regional church he's commending. But then he goes on in correction. But this I have against you, that you have lost your first love. And that's the danger of being caught up in the cares and worries of the world, folks. You lose your first love. COVID or George Floyd or, or violent protests or elections become more important to you than your first love. It's not, it's not just theory. This is reality. And, and I, that's what I want to exhort you lovingly as your brother, not to let that happen, to fight that and to resist that. And, to, and, to, and instead, to make your first love your first love again. So Jesus goes on, therefore repent, uh, therefore from where you have fallen, uh, repent and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and I will remove the lampstand out of its place unless you repent. The lampstand represents the church, the church of, Ep the church of Ephesus. If the church of Ephesus would suffer loss if the Christians there did not repent and return to their first love. I think there's a lot of comatose churches in America. Churches where there's Holy Spirit's not really free to move, where the, where the Word of God is not preached accurately. Uh, there are seven denominations that I know of preaching heresy in America. Um, there's a, there's, the church in America is in trouble. This church is not in trouble. 
but this church may have some people in it who are caught up in the, in, in, in the things of the world and they've lost their first love. And that's what this message is all about. So he ends up saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So there's eternal blessings and there are uh, earthly blessings for returning to your first love. Um, let's turn to, so how do we do this? Let's turn to Luke 11. Luke 11, verses 1 to 13, is where one apostle or one disciple says to Jesus, I just noticed you prayed, Jesus. Would you teach us how to do that? And so he leads them in what we call the Lord's Prayer. And right after that, he continues his instruction in prayer. So I don't know if you've ever done this, connected this next section to, this is all an answer to the question, or to the request, teach us to pray. So listen carefully from Luke 11, starting with verse 5. Suppose one of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, three loaves of bread, all right? For a friend of mine has come to, me from, come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. Well, that's a, that's a legitimate need. Uh, he has company, unexpected company, so he goes to a friend and says, hey, can you give me some food for my friend? And the friend says, and from inside, he, he shall answer and say, do not bother me. My door is already shut, and my children and I are in bed. I don't know where his wife is. I cannot give up and give you anything. Maybe he's, a, he's, maybe he's a single father. I cannot get up and give you anything, because at that point, a lot of husbands said, honey, will you get up? <laughs> uh, I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, and this is Jesus again, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet, because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Incredible. Now, this is Jesus teaching on prayer. And he goes on. He says, And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. And he goes on to talk about if you ask for a fish, you won't get a snake. If you ask for an egg, you won't get a scorpion. And the last verse, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So that's Jesus' response to the guy who says, hey, would you teach me to pray? It wasn't just the Lord's Prayer. It was this section here where, a, it's a parable, where a guy goes to a friend and the, guy, the friend says, uh-uh, I'm in bed. You're, I'm, I'm your friend, but it, it's too late, buddy. Friendship only goes so far. But then the guy keeps saying, no, 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 you can't go to sleep. I've got to have that bread. I'm not going to go leave your door until I, until I get that bread. Hello, you're up there. I, I'm here. My guest is hungry. Hello, where are you? And the door opens. And there is a man standing with a big handful of food. Jesus says, that's how you should pray. So... If you are struggling with not being able to keep your eyes on the Lord, you're being caught up in this wave after wave of stuff on the news and, and in the country, and you find yourself, you know, you look at Jesus, and then all of a sudden you're, you're like kicked away, and you're, you're, you are you got to look at this, and you got to look at that, and you're, all your emotions are going this, like a, you know, like a topsy-turvy thing. How do, you, how do you get out of that cycle? Well, pray like that. Get before God, get alone or with a friend and say, Jesus, I need help here. I need the Holy Spirit to change me. I need the Holy Spirit so I can forgive and, let, and release that and get back, my eyes back on you. I need, I need you in my, I need to seek first the kingdom of God and not all this other stuff. I can't fix COVID. I can't fix race relations. I can't fix the elections. But Lord, you can. And my job is to love you, serve you, and obey you, and you take care of all that big stuff. Jesus, help me. So that's where it starts. And the second thing, the second place you need to go is where Jesus, where all those commands in Scripture where it says, folks, you're not, in the, you're not here alone. 
you're a family. Love one another. There's about 25 one another commands. Love one another, serve one another, encourage one another. It even says, you know, rebuke one another at times, but encourage one another and help bear one another's burdens. Help bear one another's burdens. We pastors, I'll, I know I'll speak for myself, we have not taught people the communal um, uh, uh, aspects of discipleship enough. We have made it seem as if it's all up to you. You, d you have to become holy by yourself. You have to become obedient. You have to be fervent by yourself. You have to do this. You, it's all up to you. We've never said, get together and help one another. There are people here who have strengths who will help you with your weaknesses. You don't know how to be a good parent, maybe, in some ways. I just was reminded yesterday, I didn't teach my kids well how to express anger. And one of my kids has been suffering for years because she bottles up all of her anger and it's been hurting her physically. And she's just realized it's because she doesn't know how to get her anger out because I didn't know how to get my anger out. So if I had sat down with uh, somebody who, who did express their anger well, you know, be angry but sin not, I could have learned that a long time ago and it would have protected me and my kids. We can help one another in practical ways. Some of you struggle with your prayer life. You don't know how to have a quiet time. There's lots of people here who don't have a quiet time, right? Some of you struggle with anger issues. You're, you get, you get, it grabs you and it won't let hold of you. People can talk to you and pray with you and you can be set free. You don't have to live there if you're, if you're willing to get help. All right, so reflect and take risk. And, and one of the risks would be to get into a group. And so I've asked my beautiful, wonderful, amazing wife, Beth, to come up here and talk about a group that she's involved in that's bearing a lot of fruit in her life. Now we have small groups in the church. Uh, we don't have very many people in those small groups. So, and thank God that you're in a group if you're in a group. But this is a variation on that that I think you'll find helpful. I think I need a mic. Oh yeah, well she can borrow mine. Um, no, don't do that. I'm, I'm getting a, I'm getting a nose signal. I thought we could, were supposed to share. You know. <laughs> I can just stand close enough. <laughs> what, or what are we going to do? Yeah. All right, just keep talking. Go ahead, talk. Oh, we're good. You can hear me. All okay. right. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of things to share. Uh, well, I have time. I've got a few minutes. Um, what I want to talk to you about is something that, I've, that Bob and I have both come across called fellowship bands. And, but I want to start with just something God told me. Um, I need to get what? Is it okay? Oh, it's on. Yeah. It's something God told me uh, a couple of months ago when I'm praying about, like, where I think all of us have been. I'm just kind of stuck in this morass that's all around me, and I don't know how to get out. And um, what I felt like God told me, he said, game on. You know, he would say, what do I do? He says, game on. And I said, you know, what? And he basically, this is what he told me. He said that I had been sidelined by all the commotion, like Bob's been describing. I had been sidelined, um, and he was now calling me into the game. Um, he said, it's a quick transition. He said, go to your position. The game is on. You are needed. You are necessary. Pick up what I place in your hands. Be ready. You are prepared. And I just think that's a, a quick word just to all of us here. Yeah, you're prepared. You're prepared to be in that good soil and to produce the fruit that comes out of that good soil. So don't let yourself be sidelined. Okay, um, but now what I'm going to say <laughs> is one of the ways, the one another's, you know, I love, Bob was wrong. There are 59 one another's in scripture. Some say 56 because he says love one another, love one another, love one another, you know, three I times. It, That's it, an important one. At least one. 25. At least. He said at least, <laughs> so he was correct. <laughs> <clears throat> Much more. And I'm thinking, you know, well, well, gee, what's my favorite? Well, there was one I used with my kids when they were arguing having a fight. Kids don't do that, right? You know, no, you know. So I would, I didn't know what to say to him. So I'd say, love one another, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. There's three of them right there, as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. So, but there's another one that's, um, I think, really key, and it's Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. And that's, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, 
but encourage one another. Okay, and there's a way to do that, even in COVID, to not give up meeting together in the way that Bob and I have found. Um, we all need fellowship. That's who we are as human beings, is we need to be in contact with other human beings. But, you know, as Christians, we are commanded to have fellowship with one another. That's not, oh, it's nice because I'm a person and I like to, you know, we're commanded. So how do we do that? Well, Bob and I have come, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me, upon something last summer, and it's called Fellowship Bands. We went out to visit our daughter, Kelly, and she is in a band, not a musical band, but a fellowship band. And uh, yeah, and with one of, and it's been life-giving. She's talked to me about it for several years. One of the ladies in her band, Sam is her name, Samantha, and she and her husband are British, and they had, um, uh, what would be the word, developed, um, founded a group called Inspire Network. And in the Inspire Network, they have outlined how to have a fellowship band, a small group of believers meeting together to love, encourage, and spur one another on to love and good works. And uh, so we talked to her about it. We got information. I got a pamphlet on it. And I came back home to a small group that I've met with. There are four ladies I've met with for many years now, five, six, I don't know how many we've been meeting together. Bible study became a prayer group, and we've moved on. And I said, oh, this is what we're doing. We're doing this fellowship band stuff. And uh, so we've made, um, found a structure, a little more of a structure to our group um, to listen to one another. We come, and it's a time to say, what's God doing in your life? Where are you at this week? What's going on with you this week? And we listen. We listen to one person at a time, and then we pray. And we listen to the Lord. What does the Lord have to say to, you know, the person that we're praying for? Bob said, oh, I want to do that too. And he's got a band of four men that he meets with. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm saying all this to say we can do it. You know, that um, you want to, well, first of all, let me say, the structure of the band, the four ladies, the things we do in the band, we recognize at the start that Jesus is present and active in our meeting. Then we share our week in a safe place so that no one is bearing their burdens alone. We share what God has been teaching us along the way. We pray for one another. We listen to the Holy Spirit for prayers of encouragement and wisdom for the person we're praying for. We are doing the one another's of scripture within this small group. We are doing life together, even in the midst of COVID. We are loving each other in word and deed. We share our joys and our sorrows. We meet in person in a home with social distance and um, for two months at the beginning of COVID, we met on Zoom. And Bob meets with his group bi-weekly. And then, but it's not only the, we're there to lift each other up, but like, you know, the outreach then. And a part of it too is, is well, now what's our missional impact on the world and how do we encourage one another and what are we doing in the world? One of the ladies, Miss Joan, I'll talk about her. One of the ladies has, um, keeps bags of food in her car. So when she comes across the, um, you know, homeless that are, asking for a donation she's got she's got a bag of food and other items ready to just say here and you know I think puts don't you, don't you put a scripture or something in them too something but anyway Joan Joan has done that for years and we encourage her with that um, so there are ways little ways we're not all out there you know walking around like these two wonderful people that are you know really three I guess where's the other one um, you know really sharing the gospel and winning souls but there are things that each one of us does and has in our hands that we can do to, to reach the world, to um, go out beyond. But we can do it from a safe place in a small group where we love, support, encourage, and do the one another's together. And I just say, um, I'm going to do a training on it um, to get a little more information in January. If anyone's interested in knowing more about fellowship bands, talk to me. You can take that. That's it. Take that. Thank you, Beth. And, um I hope you'll talk to my wife. Uh, it's a really uh, wonderful thing. It's based on the Wesley groups, actually, from the Second Great Awakening, those bands. Uh, I'd like to end this message with a testimony, an exhortation from one of our members, James Hall. How many know James Hall? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Get to know James Hall. He is a real man of God. Um, uh, he's been ordained. Um, Pastor Chris was at his ordination. He's got a calling on his life. He has a ministry called Father Heart Ministry. And I called him the other day and just to see how he was doing. And I got more uplifted than he did on that call. 
And so I, I recorded um, two minutes uh, and 40 seconds of, of his testimony. It's an exhortation to all of us to live as an active, fervent disciple of Jesus Christ. So I guess I have to play that, is that right? I have to hit that. All right, the little green button someplace. Uh, During this time, this is the perfect time. God is perfect in everything he does. And during this time is the time for us that we can spend more time with the Lord getting getting a revelation from him and what it is that he wants us to do. And we just can't be sitting around twiddling our thumbs while he's doing that because the fact is that the Lord, in whatever state we find ourselves in, we still are his servants. And what I do, what I did when this first started coming out, when this epidemic came out, what I did was I pleaded blood over all six of my kids. I anointed my grandkids. I anointed my wife. I spoke, plead the blood over her. I read Psalm 91 over them, and I covered them in the blood of Jesus. And I never stopped doing what I was doing before this started. I still go to the stores, but I'm also, I also use wisdom in doing what the the state or the government are telling us to do. I keep a hand, uh, uh, my face covered, and I we keep uh, hand sanitizer and do all of that. I still get up every morning, go out to the park, and I spend time with the Lord because that is my altar is out at the park. And God sent people my way to minister to, to encourage. I prayed for the sick. Man got healed. Mm -hmm. People been getting healed at the park. People getting delivered at the park. Praise All God. different things. So we just got to continue. And I encourage you, Pastor Bob, mm -hmm. Pastor Fox, yes. that to continue to strengthen the people and minister to them concerning whatever it is God has given you to do. This yeah. ain't the time to shrink back. This is the time to, to charge. It, God, we got to understand who we are in Him. I think sometimes we forget great is He that is in us than He that is in the world. The world is still trying to go forward, and we is trying to get reclusive. Uh -huh. Well, Chris and, 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 and uh, his wife, everybody, I said, hello, and I love him. I'll be getting in touch with him. Amen. Isn't that good? That was a good word. So um, James goes out to the park by locks in Chesapeake two or three times a day and walks and prays, and people come up to him. And he prays with them. He's, he's had some healings. Uh, he has a ministry. He's called the chaplain of the park out there. Yeah. E so everybody can do something, uh, whatever the Lord tells you to do. I'd like you to um, consider uh, changing your vocabulary in three ways. When you think of coronavirus, the word corona is from the Latin meaning crown. Think of the crown of Jesus, corona Jesus. So Jesus, because he is the king, he has rule and authority over all of your life. You're safe with him. And, and that our job is to follow the leading of the king. He's our master. And, and then when you think about the unjust death of many black men, I want you to re remember even more the unjust death of Jesus. Because his death has much bigger implications and, and, uh, and value for your life than whatever happens here on earth. And when you think of the elections, I want you to think of your election, that you were chosen. That's what it means. You, you were chosen by God to be his child before the world was made, and that your election means that he has work for you to do here on earth as a disciple of Jesus. Your life has purpose, cosmic, eternal purposes. You're not just a cog in a wheel. You've been bought with the blood of Jesus. God Almighty lives inside of you. Jesus is praying for you. The Holy Spirit's praying for you. And so let's pray with, for one another now. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. 
to be reminded of the eternal realities that nothing on earth, no event, no war, no catastrophe, no pandemic can ever change. The word of God does not change. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, our lives are based upon your word, not upon our circumstances or our feelings. The injustices of the world have always been there. You said that the whole world would hate us because of your name, that we would be persecuted because you were persecuted. Lord, suffering is part of this world. In the world, we will have tribulation. But you said, be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. So God, we turn our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we choose to run our race with you, close to you, following you with endurance, so that one day, Lord, we can stand before you with great joy and say, we did our best. We kept our eyes on you. We, we obeyed as well as we could. And, and, and look, Father, we have brought others with us. Others are coming home to heaven because of our witness, because of our service, because of our life. Oh, Lord, I just bless you that today you have spoken to us, and I pray that every heart here will be fourth soil hearts, that the word of God will dwell richly in their hearts, that the peace of God will, that passes all understanding will just fill their hearts no matter what happens because they're keeping their eyes on you. They're returning to your first love. They're doing the deeds they did when they first met you. Oh, God, it's only by your grace. Holy Spirit, woo us, change us, make us, Lord. Make us like Jesus. Make us like Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen and amen. God bless you. And if you want any prayer for anything, just come forward and uh, Beth and I and some other leaders here will pray with you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being disciples of Jesus. And I'm thankful that we are together in this journey towards heaven, bearing fruit that would last forever. God bless you. And we'll hope to see you Wednesday night for the Thanksgiving Eve service. You're dismissed.